Ford. Got a nice little audience and, waiting in there for you, James. Nice. Yeah. Yeah. And James, just a, a little reminder. Um, I've got a little bit of lag because I'm out in uh, boonies here on a satellite. So uh, forgive me if it sounds like I ever talk over here. It's just oh, it's oh, always navigating away. that. Uh, can, can you hear okay. me? I didn't get any notification there. Uh, of yep, sound good to me. Yep, we are we are live. Hey, everybody in the chat, thanks for joining us. We are with the great James Tunney today. Very excited about this one. Um, really loved our chat uh, last time, James. I shared that again with the community for those that missed it. It was uh, one of the highlights last year for AlphaCast. And um, also our chat on the end of COVID was phenomenal. So um, not sure if I ever sent that to you, James. If not, remind me, I'll send that to you so you can post that to your community because that really was a phenomenal chat that we had. I will, I will put it up, yeah. Yeah, great. Okay, guys, I'm going to go ahead and hit record and record and fire this up. Excited for a uh, continuation on our chat uh, today. So here we go. And boom, we're back for another episode of AlphaCast. I'm Mike Winner, and I'm here, as always, with the ever astute Dr. Bear Paul Lando, Coming to you live and direct from the great state of Jefferson, where freedom reigns supreme here on the beautiful Smith River that is full, full up to the brim. We've been having a downpour again uh, because this is an undammed wild river. It goes up and down according to the rainfall. The springs are flowing in and it is gorgeous uh, flowing. A lot of steelhead coming in. Hopefully I'd like to maybe try to fish one of these days if I ever get time, Bear. And then you're telling me, Bear, you're getting snow at the farm today. So <laughs> yeah, it stopped now, but uh, the rain turned into snow. We, yeah, we were warned about snow warnings, so we beat feet into town to take care of business, knowing that we'd be trapped in here for a few more days. <laughs> uh, we were wow. trapped in for a good week uh, just recently because uh, you know we have a a narrow river canyon with a windy country road, and uh, the whole hillside came down with huge boulders it took them a week to clear it and anyway that's life out here in uh in the nether regions that might be a, a useful behind strategy the north in wall the <laughs> yeah. yeah i was just gonna say that james james <laughs> tunney's with us today really looking forward to the chat and i said i was just thinking that james great minds think alike the benefit yeah. of that of course is it easy to shut off <laughs> people from coming in yes. yeah. <laughs> That's why we're here. <laughs> well, that'll play nicely into our chat today a bit. Um, we're here with James. I just wanted to remind people uh, one thing, uh, Music and Sky tickets have launched. Go check it out, musicandsky.com. Uh, come with us uh, and, and enjoy the uh, presence of Bear Lando live and in effect June 20th through the 24th in the beautiful Black, Black Oak Ranch in, in Laytonville, California. It is three uh, three hours north of San Francisco in the wilds of NorCal. There is no cell service on the site. We will have a couple Wi-Fi spots for emergencies, but you're coming in to integrate with nature and to really dive deep into community and co-creation. We have a ton of amazing speakers and musicians and all that good stuff happening. So that's June 20th through the 24th, Music and Sky. It's happening, guys. Uh, very exciting. Uh, Barry, so are you going to so um, so are you gonna have a support group there for all the folks withdrawing from their devices? Yes, we'll have uh, cuddle puddles and um, <laughs> and uh, all sorts of grounding stations and uh, anxiety uh, hugs and all that for people that are going through their withdrawals. <laughs> it sounds like alternative um, alternative Bohemian Grove. <laughs> yes. Oh, we will be burning a giant owl, FG. <laughs> the cremation of care uh, goes yeah. down the first night, James, of course. <laughs> well, hey, uh, we're so excited to jump back into this conversation. It's quite apropos for everything that's going on. Um, as the world burns, too, I just wanted to uh, send our thoughts out to everybody in Texas right now in the panhandle that's uh, being affected by these insane fires in, the, in like, end of February. Over 500,000 acres have burned, mostly agricultural ranch land. Hmm, makes you think something, Bear. Uh, maybe they don't want an autonomous region in the uh, empire of the states. 
Um, but um, as I was saying in the chat and what I spoke about at Anarchapoco is we're, we can decree to nature uh, to overcome the technological systems because it's still rel they rely upon our consensus and our uh, and on nature itself. So we take back uh, through decreeing and stop these fires and all this nonsense. So uh, it just comes with yeah. awareness. And as we'll talk about a lot, this is going to feed right into our talk today about how we take this. And back. interesting, you mentioned that, Mike, because this morning I was in the member section and I decided in the spirit science section, I'm going to start a whole decree section uh, for folks that aren't familiar with the elementals, the powers of nature uh that uh we have specific decrees for that and it's not new age hocus pocus because if you live like we do out here those uh, elementals become very alive and real if you know how to tune into them so take it away michael yeah and i i hope we can dive a little bit into the true sciences today i i know you both are big fans of Goethe. And this can tap a bit into Steiner and mass consciousness and our relationship to nature because I see that as a major key note moving forward. Uh, but simply put, AI is an algorithmic problem-solving process confined to pre-programmed computational parameters. In less technical terms, making chocolate chip cookies and strict adherence to grandma's recipe is an example of rote conformity versus authentic chefery. <laughs> AI proponents embrace the concept of evolutionary materialism in which machine-induced computations represent the next logical progression to greater intelligence. There is a very realistic apprehension that we are falling lockstep toward Hollywood's predictably programmed Terminator world. The stark realization of an overly compliant, functionally illiterate, and device-addicted populace portends an ominous prognosis. But efforts to supplant human consciousness with AI has sparked a spiritual revival. Acclaimed author James Tunney returns today with us to further elaborate on our prior transhumanism discussion through the context of his latest work, AI Posthumanism, a Cryptic Soap Opera. In James' own words, quote, Artificial intelligence as a phenomenon has now penetrated the universal consciousness. It is pervasive, persistent and potentially our end as well. Post-humanism describes and promotes the diminished and disappearing human in the world of emerging AI. AI and post-humanism are really two arms of a pincher moment that will be applied to the human race through smart systems, which will enclose us. AI post-humanism indicates a phenomenon of a technological movement and its philosophical description. AI posthumanism was planned for more than a century at least. Both elements of AI posthumanism are calculated to deconstruct and reconstruct us. We are to be built back better or abolished. Build back better, guys. Uh, we are in a game. You and all your race are the prize. The reason why most are unaware is because of the essentially cryptic nature of the forces that intend to govern us globally at a collective as well as an individual level ai posthumanism aims to take your spiritual consciousness or soul a deep sense of cleaning up humanity to enter the technocratic society will alter us fundamentally um that is a mouthful but so uh, on point i say bear uh take it away sir yes well forgive my uh chocolate chip cookie analogy there but i hope you got my point <laughs> i didn't want to minimize your great work there james so james thank you so much for making time for us and uh we're really excited for a long time to have you back and uh let's take it up right where we left off that's a little bit late at a time of day uh for you so um again we appreciate you just being here uh what we'd like to do again is uh you know continue where we left off and and hopefully uh, really have you walk us through your next book it's it's a, it, it's a brilliant work and and um, you know really I think is furthering our understanding of kind of the predicament we're in and for folks that um, feel that this might be a little bit of a dark subject and it is <laughs> because uh, you know we're way down the road uh, from where I ever thought we'd be, you know, in my earlier lifetime. And I think 
you know, when people ask me, well, do you think this is going to take hold? Are the machines going to win? Or when did this start? Well, the, the truth of the matter is, in my opinion, this started a long, long time ago. And some of us were warning of the direction we're headed many years ago. And the whole end game here, you know, we can get into all the sci-fi aspects that have become real, but when they started leading us into scientism versus authentic science, you know, with atomic theory of matter and more of these uh, mechanistic superstitious thoughts, the whole goal was to convince us spiritual, powerful spiritual beings having a human experience that we are just these stick figures held together by, uh, you know, a bunch of BBs uh, glued through covalent bonding and that somehow we were a product of matter with nothing to say about it, which obviously is a complete inversion of the truth. So James, thank you uh, once again. So maybe we'll just start this a little open-ended and if you would like to just catch us up to speed of maybe what prompted uh, the writing of your second book and what uh, our audience could expect when we start reading it. Yeah. Second book on AI, I think it's the 11th book, uh, but I did two books on AI this year. Um, just before I go on, a apropos Texas, um, there's, there's an interest, well, a hor horrific thing going on in Nigeria where Catholics are being executed in, in churches and during mass and that. And when it comes to Europe, the politicians say it's the reason why this is happening. And it's not because of armed terrorist gangs have come into the church and, and massacred men, women and children. Uh, in prayer, but because of climate change, I just want to leave that point to think about them. Uh, it's it's horrific, um, and I, I don't go think along with that. Yeah, I don't think the universe is going to uh, forgive these <laughs> this, uh, Judas class. Uh, they're going to have their own suffering uh, from what the, what they have done. Um, so, so the, the earlier book this year was on AI and mythology, and arguing that most of the discourse on AI is mythological. And now I know, Bar, Bear, that you've talked about this in relation to medicine. It's the same principle. There's two reasons why it's myth. Well, there's a number of reasons why it's mythological. Uh, one, because uh, it, it hides the military-industrial complex origins of AI, and that, that's the main reason. Um, secondly, there is a deeper, dark magic. They are telling you it's magic because they intend to use it in sorcerous ways, as cyberneticians uh, anticipate. So when they're saying it's magic, they kind of mean that in a way. So when Bill Gates said these vaccines are magic, you know, it should worry you when Elon Musk comes out immediately and says this AI is magic, uh, that the genie is out of the bottle. All this kind of language, as you said, bear superstitious stuff. And people are, 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 fo are fooled by that. And there is a deeper mytho mythological impetus, which I, I, I would describe as the Promethean one, in the sense of the Prometheus that struggles against the gods, the, to, to rule the gods so that the titanic force, not the human force, the titanic force or the titanic class can uh, come to power. So I, I've explained that reason, and uh, it's predictable. I mean, the, the things that I said at, uh, in parallel were, were coming true before my eyes. And then what happens in the United States is you forget about the power of London and the old British Empire in this new form. So even you notice that the first summit on AI, uh, AI safety with Elon Musk and that was at Bletchley Park. And that's a clue because that's really going back to the source of the empire of the mind from 1943, as Churchill described it, when Bletchley Park in conjunction with the, with the Americans began to develop the, 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 the NATO uh, alliance to serve the machine. This is what the texts say, incredibly, that some of the books that grounded NATO, uh, it said these international organizations have to be set up to serve the machine. It's unbelievable. But that, that's what happened. goes back to Francis Bacon, the new Atlantis, the, the importance of, of the Atlantic, his vision of a scientific elite community uh, ruling the world through intelligence. Intelligence, of course, means different things. It means spirits, but it also means knowledge about you and knowledge that can be used against you in a Machiavellian sense. So the notion of intelligence, we haven't thought about sufficiently as it goes back to John Dee, etc. So um, uh, AI and post-humanism, for me, uh, the, the, the latest books, describes a movement which is in addition to transhumanism and if you look at the graph of the usage of the word transhumanism, transhumanism actually plateaued off a little while ago. 
So, I mean, the work on that has been going on, but post-humanism is the one that has continued. You, you can chart a relationship between the usage of certain philosophical terms and what's happening in, the, uh, in other contexts. For example, if you chart the usage of the word deconstruction, it parallels the policy of deregulation that happened in the United States and, and, and Britain, and it was deliberate so. So some of these concepts are informed by the Rockefeller military industrial complex and all that, and they come into the uh, equation. Um, there is good, if you look at the book, for example, Control the Gark, he gives a good description of what happened in the United States. But what they're not doing is looking back to the origins in uh, in, in the empire as a transform by H.G. Wells, etc. And H.G. Wells, as we know, is a key figure. Um, and so when we're interpreting whether UFOs are landing and whether we have to change, because a lot of the UFO advocates or people that are telling us about all these secret things are saying, this means that we have to upgrade, we have to become transhumanist, we need extensions to deal with this. And, and of course, this is War of the Worlds from the 19th century that that H.G. Wells in London, again, uh, set up where the Martians are landing, you know, in, uh, in the north of London and around London. Um, and this was, this has always been used as a leverage to, uh, to justify action. So what I argue in this book is that we have AI, which is from the military industrial complex, which is about control, which goes back to the foundational separation of scientists in, in Britain in the 1830s, when they separated from people like Coleridge and the, the natural philosophers, and they went a different way. And so you had people like Babbage and, 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 uh, in, and, and Hewell who, who congregated, and they concentrated really on machines that would serve other purposes, in particular the empire. And that's where we get the, uh, the, the father of the computer. That's where we get computing coming from. There are always for administrative purposes and for, for management purposes. And that's where science comes from in its proper, in its modern form, as distinct from the natural philosophers that, that was up to then, Goethe, etc. Coleridge exemplified, they were, they were against Coleridge, they were against people having a wider perspective. And the, of course, we know that we don't have to rehearse the argument about AI going to military industrial complex and up through the uh, Bletchley Park and up through cybernetics and up through, uh, through the various iterations. Uh, true um, Bush, et cetera, or the, 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 the uh, foundation, the, the various offices in the United States that, that developed the military industrial complex from the Manhattan Project, et cetera. I, I, we know all about that. But now we're, so, so we have AI in a situation uh, where it's intended to govern us. It's, it's, its objective is governance. He, already in Britain, the ministers are saying they don't read the red boxes or they, they, they give it to AI. They are, they're abolishing civil service in the civil servants in the UK in certain departments for AI. Now, this is what my argument is: that AI is to govern you, to to be the governance system of the of the, the the new world order. So that's what AI's function is. But its deeper function is to control your consciousness. That's what its objective is: to have control over your consciousness for the people that run the system. And in that sense, I argue that it's it's taking its objective is to take over your what I call your spiritual consciousness, the spirit. But we'll say spiritual consciousness, because consciousness has always been an attempt to redefine the spirit that they took out of uh, of discourse from the X club. X is significant from uh, ten, uh, from uh, Thomas H. Huxley, 1864, the X club. They set up in London to take spirit out of, of, of discourse. Um, so AI is there, and then we have this post-humanism thing. Now, transhumanism is defined, in my view, by its effort to enhance the individual's capability or augment them by technological or other prosthetic ways, so that they are they go beyond the recovery of normal, legitimate expectations. So people start off and say, "Oh, well, a pair of glasses is, you know, a pair of glasses is is uh, transhumanism, isn't it?" No, it's not, uh, because the they're re, they're restoring your vision to what they see as a standard, say the twenty twenty vision. So it's it's normal expectations of a particular thing based on bell curve, all that kind of stuff, or or, or what's optimum, or what they conceive as optimum. 
but we're, we're talking about deeper enhancement. So if I change you genetically so your eyes will be able to see in the dark, for example, would be a good example of a possible transhumanist thing. Now, to some extent, I don't care what you do with your body, but I care what you do with my body. So network transhumanism, the collectivization of transhumanism is the problem where they say, they say, OK, here, all the, all the money is gone. Uh, here's your digital currency. You get to say, OK, digital currency, we have the digital currency on a phone. And then say, oh, oops, oops a daisy. That's not very good. We have to improve it. So here's the little chip in your head in order so you can transact and buy and sell, etc. And then you're gone. Once it's in your body, you are gone because there's an opportunity cost about what you pay attention to. And they begin to broadcast into your body. That's clear from the uh, from the technology that's available to them. I, so um, network transhuman I, is, a, is a big problem. Sorry, did you? I, I would just uh, comment quickly that it's already in our body. Um, you know, it's just doing it remotely through frequencies. And also, it's interesting that the technologies in use uh, without our permission or our consent are also destroying our biological integrity because, as they know, they could deliver frequencies that are beneficial rather than destroying our neurology. Uh, but we know the end game is to have us so weakened in body, mind, and soul that we're easier to control. So please, sorry to interrupt. Absolutely. And the current, I'm writing a pamphlet currently about pico science. Uh, that uh, this thing will be below the level of nanoscience. The objective is to have a, a one trillionth of a meter, 10 minus 12, the power of minus 12. There's no way that you're going to have the equipment to even know that anything like like this is happening. So what's happening is we're being possessed. So and this is a problem I have with the the good guys, exorcists. They don't understand this technological method of possession, and and they they oh well AI is just a tool. No, they're missing a, something wrong in in not understanding this. So as you said, uh, and also I'll, I'll, I'll elaborate that another time, but. Uh, I believe that they intend to pixelate the entire planet, to digitize the entire planet, so there's nothing which is beyond scrutiny or surveillance. I believe that that's a deep, a deep goal associated with smart dust and that. But we can come back to that some other time. But the um, so post-humanism then, what's post-humanism as distinct from transhumanism? We consider transhumanism as the augmentation, and some people say, therefore, for example, the contraceptive pill. Um, Kate Harrington says is uh, it's transhumanism because you're suppressing the normal function of the body through pros prosthetic means as some people would consider uh, certain drugs as pro well most drugs <laughs> as prosthetics especially, especially the pharmaceutical drugs in that they they enhance or they give you a function um, which may not have been there before so there's a whole right we if we go back to Lewis Mumford he was considering really the whole machine as as, as a a kind of precursor of this transhumanism, the cars, car system, how we we adapt to the machine and become cyborg. Elon Musk says we're cyborgs already with our mobile phones, and, and that's true to a, to, a, to a large extent. So post-humanism comes along. Now transhumanism, people forget, came from the humanists. Julian Huxley was one of the celebrated humanists. So transhumanism came from the humanists, and the humanists maybe I should have a note about humanism. Humanism is at the core of this and what it means. Now, there's a lot of good friends of mine, family that are humanists, but they don't sus subscribe to these things or they don't know that they subscribe to what it actually means. Um, humanism um, is often associated with the Renaissance, uh, although it goes much further back. And if you look at certain humanists, they would bring it back to Socrates and, uh, and their idea of what the human was. And I think they're a good place. Go back to the Axial Age, uh, Buddhism and, and Christianity was very important in the notion of the human, as Jung uh, corroborates, as Illich explains, as Steiner emphasizes uh, the notion of individuality. But anyway, you can put it at certain dates. They often focus on the rena on Renaissance humanism as, as representing a a shift in the in the depth of the consideration uh, of what it, what it means to be a human. And um, after the Renaissance, we have a kind of reduced view of what the human is. We have a movement away from any sense 
that are linked to a divine full context that we interact with the stars and all this. We have a reduction through the enlightenment. Uh, although it's meant to be an expansion, it's a reduction. We have uh, true identification of reason as the essence of human uh, endeavor. For example, the Marquis de Sade, one of the, the, the champions of reason. Uh, these are the people that they have to justify when they're justifying reason. Uh, the French Revolution, the scientific view Condor set around 1800, let's rule the world by science. It's shifting all the time into a narrower view. Uh, and certainly getting rid of God, once they get rid of God, they get rid of religion. Once they get rid of religion, well, the Nietzschean influence as well. Once we get rid of that, then we get rid of spirit in the 1860s, throw spirit out the window. Interesting point relevant to Bear, you talked about uh, alchemy and you've talked, uh, explained in some of your talks about alchemy and the, the four elements and explained how that, that, that relate. George Bernard Shaw, now I've met people, I've met a, he's dead now, who, who, who met Shaw and interviewed him and uh, who, who could reproduce his Dublin accent. Of course, he's from Dublin. Uh, and I know he, George Bernard Shaw was, was good friends with Gene Tunney, whose son I know was very interested in Shaw. So I'm quite, uh, quite interested in, in, in Shaw. But Shaw, when he was at school, he explained that what was taught then before the theory of evolution was the four elements. That was the scientific theory that was taught in, in school. Mm -hmm. So he was learning that. So that's, that's only... Uh, that's only effectively going back uh, a generation before these people that were alive. Uh, or he, he's not that far back. He lived to, to quite old. So, so w the four element theory, the, when, when the evolutionary theory came, the people from the four element perspective didn't buy it, and the religious people didn't buy it. It's quite interesting. It's, it's, there's a nuanced bit. But what some of the elemental, the four element people did was they said no. They took the Lamarckian view and they said evolution is based on will and will and what we we decide to do and that kind of contributed towards in another way towards the fabian socialist eugenicist movement and you can see it in magic you can see it in uh, nietzsche nietzsche you can see it in alistair crowley it's will is the most important There's nothing else only the superiority of will and this this kind of evolutionary magical interventionist upper class perspective based on a class that was fascinated with breeding, with dogs, with horses, with themselves, who also understood that you could get problems because one of the reasons they were interested in evolutionary theory was they had so many diseases from inbreeding that they they wanted to correct those things. That's that's one other reason mm -hmm. uh, they understood the, 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 the concept. This is also the class that gave us horror the, 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 the genre of horror really came from the British upper class uh, and the middle class. And even in the Irish context, Bram Stoker and all that, they were Protestant ascendancy class. And that goes Shel back to Shelley with view. Frankenstein. Yeah, that's right. And um, uh, although uh, I, I like I like Mary Shelley, and that's an interesting thing, because <laughs> when you say that, um, Shelley, she was she she was presented an antidote towards what she saw around her as of, well, what does this Promethean force mean yep. with, with her husband? So she comes along and says, this is what this is going to mean. I've seen Galvani and Aldini and all these regenerating the bodies and believing that it's just electricity in the body. This, this could go wrong. So she was one of the, she was one of the people that understood in the early part of the 19th century where this could go on and really uh, astute on my admiration for, her perception behind Frank Frankenstein as a critique. And she also wrote The Last Man, uh, about The Last yep. Man. Actually. I would yeah. say Edgar Allan Poe as well, James, uh, was inverting that and was trying to bring a little bit more thought to the danger of, of this through the horror genre. Let me come back. I have to, I have to link them up to, to explain the link. I, I, I'd love to TV hear your um, perspective on Poe. I, I'm going to but, link, link them, okay. uh, explain right. where they come together. Just let, so post-humanism then really comes out of post-modernism. There's the same people involved in it. Um, now, when we say post-modernism, you know, you can have endless academic debates about what it means or, and, and post-humanism. So post-humanism uh, can mean post-human, post-humanism in the sense of what humanism is, uh, or it can mean a, a combination it can mean a situation past 
transhumanism. But f- when you get underneath it all, it essentially means the end of the human as we know it. There's no other way. Now, there are there are academics at the start of their career doing interesting articles about post-human, explaining what it, what, what it is in nice ways and aiming to do good things. So I'm not really talking about them. And I exclude them by putting AI and post-humanism together. So I'm really, the key thing for me is this combination. The people that say, there's the phenomenon of AI. It's there. It's a practical reality. It's not hypothetical. There's hypothetical elements. There's there's a discursive elements, but it's a, it's a real thing uh, that has, has been invested in. This is the force that we're encountering. And then you have these people that support AI. They support the movements towards being a cyborg. They support the movement towards this post-humanism because their critique is that all the environmental problems are based on this uh, according a special attention to, to the human. Now, of course, there is a there is a, a an element of truth in some of it, uh, but it's misused. There is an element of truth in uh, the argument that we have misused the environment, but it's not attributable to everybody. There's been many people around the world living in conjunction with the environment. So what this is, is a useful tool for the privileged class who has managed to control the things to put the blame on other people. And there's some brilliant inversions in this. So, for example, when I was in London as a student, there was still there was still ads in the paper, and this is in the in the left wing literature, you know, of the Irish people like apes, etc. Because of course, this stuff about uh, being like uh, being simian was based on evolutionary theory. That's what the, what the, what the accusation was. You're lower down in the evolutionary theory. So that, that was there in in the eighties in Britain. When the Irish went to America, and there's a book written from a left-wing perspective, again, is how the Irish became white. They weren't regarded as white when they came, according to this ideology, because they weren't in this uh, certain category. So there's categorization. So, um, and of course, according to science, the Irish and the Scots people are the whitest people, some of the whitest people, because they have a lack of melanin in, in, in their skin. You know, some people red-haired people, you know, I couldn't believe my mates when they get burned through their clothes and all that, their skin was so sensitive. So uh, despite that, uh, and despite the oppression uh, over hundreds of years, we don't have to go through, but they were often called white chimpanzees, etc., by the upper class in Britain. So now, all of a sudden, I'm the privileged one that has been oppressing people uh, for for years and and automatically in post-humanism, one of its major critiques is of white cisgendered male who have been oppressed and everyone, and, and, and so that's there in it. So it, it, it's now in the context, even people on the uh, point of the middle, like uh, Eric Weinstein, was talking about the suicide rates of of, of non-Hispanic uh, males in the United States. It's, it's horrific. There's a, I, I believe that this ethos is a direct correlation with with, with some of this horrible attitude and i believe that we will contribute towards mass death in the future so it's uh, i'd warn people that are in that uh, to be very very careful uh, what they're doing and especially because uh, this is a lie and it's the lie promulgated from the privileged class to, uh, through the mechanisms um, so so in this is an idea that uh, humans are not special and in particular certain groups are not special and therefore, th- some of them object to transhumanism because they fear that transhumanism could be used by the groups they're against to develop themselves individually. <laughs> you know, so uh, th- mm-hmm. this is a quite interesting uh, nuance to it. Um, and uh, so posthumanism really says, like your country, the, you might notice that the United States is being disassembled and deconstructed, although you don't, uh, you know... <laughs> Uh, that that's what's happening in the United States, and this is a policy which is happening in Ireland. Ireland is old. Ireland is gone. There's a new Ireland, whatever it's going to be. The land is there. And yeah, all that, that goes stuff. back to the, like the Club of Rome and things going on in the '70s. That was all put into policy. Yeah, all all all, all of that thing is there. World Trade Organization. People forget about that. That's why all your your industries went after the uh, Information Technology Agreement, in 1996. Zero percent tariffs on four hundred components. All the computers disappeared. Vietnam, etc., etc. So they don't—they're not dependent on these guys anymore. 
which is why they can sacrifice you as they did to the English working class. Anyway, another, another, another debate. So they have inverted privilege brilliantly uh, from the top down and convinced people that believe they're from a left wing perspective that they are serving the goals, you know, of, of, of humanity. Of course, we've seen this before. We've seen it in the Bolshevik re uh, revolution. So uh, post-humanism says it criticized uh, the, the human race in its entirety. It says all the problems associated with the environment are caused by the human race qua human. And obviously then, you know, the solution to that is to attack humans, to, to break their boundaries. The analogy with the country I was making was that now we break the boundaries into the person. So in a way, it's like the colonial thing when they went to Australia and said, well, there's actually no people there, even though there was people there. It's terra nullius. They're saying that your consciousness is terra nullius, really, that technology is going to is actually going to break down boundaries and that it should do because you're not really special. And so it doesn't it, it, it purports to be driven as well by um, supporting the rights of animals and all that. Now, I'm, I'm in favor of that. But the, the rights of animals are not supported by reducing the rights of, of, of humans, by, by increasing their responsibilities. But the objective is to, that, that, that's why Harari and that can talk about human animals. They do talk about human animals. You're the same. And, and there's consequences of, of, of that, because if, if animal welfare is not increased, you'll be getting the same treatment and, and it'll be justifiable. And I believe that's going to happen. So um, I, I don't want to, 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 to depress people. What, what, I, what I'm explaining is the view of darkness, which makes it easier to see the contrast with the light and the spiritual things. And why the people, why Steiner and all these people were trying to present a view, as you've said, of the power of spiritual consciousness. And they have to, of course, convince us that we don't have any spiritual consciousness, that it's, a, it's an illusion that uh, all the spiritual experiences hitherto uh, hallucinations, they're wrong. And, and, and that's why it's very, very important to vindicate uh, uh, human consciousness. So what I say is that if you take people that are committed to AI and committed to post-humanism, and if you look at people like Ro uh, Robert Pepperell, who wrote the, humanist, or the post humanist Manifesto of 2005, they explain the human is you know, we've moved beyond the human, technology is coming, there's new forms, it's a, all, all this uh, great vision, but everything is gone, God, nature, etc. So it's an intense materialist viewpoint. It's sold as pro-animal, pro-insect, pro, animal, pro, insect, pro um, uh, against, against certain groups, against certain he hegemonic groups. One interesting little point, they say, for example, that the legal system has never recognized women and they weren't human. And that's just not true. They confused legal capacity, legal standing, legal rec in, in a whole range of views. They say that insects were never recognized for their being. If you go back, if you knew anything about legal history, you would know that there's loads of cases, particularly e ecclesiastical cases, where the court made an order which was directed to swarms of insects. And the court the guy in the court had to go out and read it to the swarms that had come. This idea that the insects weren't regarded in the uh, legal system is also wrong. Uh, I believe that it's this move towards the insect thing is 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 part of this process. Uh, and you, I think you you've mentioned this, Baird, about the the insect view of society. This this is something. And also, uh, Guido Preparata has written in terms of the insectification of society. You can see it in Philip K. Dick in 1959. He wrote an essay called The Hanging Stranger. Uh, and it's about this force taking over the world top down. Down sounds familiar. And they're kind of insectoid. And a guy gets concerned when he's going to work and he, he sees a, a fellow hanging on, on a lamp. Uh, and, you know, he goes into work and people are not that bothered. And the reason why the people hanging around the lamp, because if they protest against it because they have some kind of empathy left. They know that they're the old humans and they can get rid of them. I mean, but but there's uh, that, that that's a tangent. So AI posthumanism is a term that I use to describe this combination and the knowledge that AI is becoming comprehensive. It's been supported and it's intended to penetrate into your consciousness with a philosophical gloss which purports to protect a whole load of underprivileged groups. And it does so 
by pulling the carpet out of groups from under privileged groups, at the same time, ultimately pulling the carpet out from the potential of protecting any other groups. And effectively, by saying there's no humanism is bad, the definition of the human, it doesn't make sense, there has never been such a thing called a human, you can't have a human rights system. It's the preparation for the deconstruction of any appeal to rights. You won't be able to appeal, uh, appeal to God. You won't be able to appeal to human dignity. You won't be able to appeal to a constitution. You won't be able to appeal to a concept of rights. It's a devastating, uh, reckless uh, reflection of the will and intent of the, uh, of the military-industrial complex, in my view, Everyone that's writing about about posthumanism is, is doing so from a favourable person. Most people, are, not, not not everybody, um, and of course, it's so complex and difficult that normal people are not reading it. And and uh, I, I, it was difficult for me to to read. I felt it was a duty to go through the literature, uh, ut utterly depressing, uh, and uh, utterly throwing out uh, a, a lot of uh, values that have been uh, gained over a period. But this is a serious thing. So, so there's no point in sugarcoating the thing anymore. The, the consequences of this will, will be bigger than uh, genocidal in its intent. Now, a lot of po uh, post-humanism would reject that and say, oh, no, it's really nice, you don't understand. And, oh, maybe because, you know, their skin color you can't understand. Well, it's really a devastating attack. And ultimately, I don't believe it's anything got to do with protecting animals or whatever, because they will, they will go with us. They will, they will be uh, destroyed in this growth of this uh, massive technological system that's inherent. And AI will just get bigger and consume resources. We know that. We know that all these advances are why we need this more new electricity. It's why... Um, or part of the reason it's why Elon Musk are saying that you're going to have blackouts because the AI demands uh, will uh, will need huge amounts of electricity as well as electricity being critical in this new economy because they're going to abolish the existing economy. We have the techno the technocracy based on electricity use. When you combine that with insertions into the human body, we have the possibility as well of the reduction of a human to an electrical component, which is what which is what uh, Steiner said it was evil, the difference between us as light beings and us as electrical. So you bring people into the system and then you, you get something similar to that which was predicted in the coming race where you have two kind of races of people and you have the vril and, and uh, something, some type of energy. But w that can be done to, uh, to turn people into different beings as well at that level, another direction. So I believe ultimately what's happening is before our eyes, you, me, and our uh, our descendants um, are being turned into ghosts. We are we are being ghosted in, in, in literally, and that includes all your ancestors hitherto, because they will have power over your genetic struggle. All your ancestors, all what they, all their struggles, and all any possible descendants. That the implication of this is that the control of your biology down to a cellular level and a subset, an atomic level, uh, molecular level is going to be controlled by AI. And that's in US legislation and the biotechnology already. That's in your, your government has done that in, in uh, September 2022, the executive order, uh, that that is, is the aim to be able to control you as, as, as a, uh, a machine. It's quite simple for people to read September the uh, 11th or 12th in, in 2022. So, uh, so really, this is not, there's no other way that it's not going to this system. And even when you look at novel systems, for example, there are interesting theories now that says if you have capital, land capital, say uh, your, your farm out there, that you can now put this on the, you may be able to put this on the balance sheet and it will be regarded as, you know, an economic asset. But of course, once you do that, you'll still be dragged into this, this machine system by the, and mummified with the red tape that you will have to, um, you won't be able to do that permaculture, you know, because we're moving into a, a techno permaculture where that, that's the only one that, 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 that will uh, survive. So, um, yes, I've, that, that sounds depressing and all that, but I, I think we have to start, have to develop a robust analysis so we can understand why we have to be who we are and what the consequences of, of uh, will be. And I also believe 
that if we can't develop spiritually and if we consent to this in a Faustian way individually, um, that we there, we do lose our we do lose our our, our, our our soul. That it is possible to prevent you as the as the like I said, a contraceptive pill can suppress the natural function, as Steiner anticipated. It will be possible to prevent a person leading a spiritual life, and that has implications for where one uh, uh, proceeds to. It's depressing in one sense, but as you both of you know, that when you activate your spiritual consciousness, because that's you're, you're, you're connecting to the highest force, that you're not going to be afraid of you know those things. The only thing you'd be afraid of is losing that capacity, and the only thing that uh, is critical is that one doesn't make that choice. So th what they can do to us, well, we've had a long history in Ireland of the range of things from genocide to mass famine, whatever. So uh, brought up in Ireland, you were led to believe that this this was the, you know, from a Republican background, that this was the force that was there and it wouldn't go away. And, and what will have to happen ultimately is this force, which is not got to do with English people or India, and I, I trace it to a particular power structure, going back to France in particular, that um, a mixture of the Vikings and the Roman families after the fall of the empire. But uh, this will have to be tackled. It might take a long time, but this force ultimately has to be tackled. We can't, we can't fall for the lies, for their willingness, their unscrupulousness, and for their willingness to destroy humans and the hatred of humans. Uh, last point, Sweden's joining NATO. All the people used to tell me that it never happened. Uh, they tell me in Ireland that Ireland would maintain its neutrality. And I said, I don't believe you. And already they've formed an agreement with NATO. Uh, so up to very recently, Sweden wasn't, although they were always, they've been fighting with Russia for, you know, for hundreds of years and uh, uh, land wars, et cetera, like that. But they weren't worried, well, in the last generation. Uh, too much. M my father-in-law's generation were out in the submarine, you know, all that kind of stuff, looking for the Russian submarines was always going on. But um, recently there wasn't that concern. So all of a sudden, when they're joining NATO, now they want the people to come and fight, you know, to, to, to enlist, to, to, to willing to fight for countries, which they told us up to recently didn't exist, weren't worth fighting for, had nothing nothing to offer. Uh, so this, this L canard and they say, they say the same to people in the united states although they're obviously going to change your army now with and and, and people it with all the people that are coming across the border to, to achieve their purposes um as, as as you realize that the united states is not governed from the united states but so so these, these canards are always are always <laughs> trotted out as uh, as right okay i'll, I'll leave it there because i'm not going on too long i I don't want to get too off base, but I'm curious. You bring up Russia, and I know Bear would be interested in your thoughts on this. There is this idea that Putin and Russia actually see all this transatlantic empire moving into transhumanism and using transgenderism and sort of all of this neoliberalism moving into this grand empire, and they are a reaction to that. You've got Russian thinkers like Alexander Dugin, who talks about fourth political theory and there are people, a lot of people actually in sort of the U.S. quote unquote freedom movement that are huge fans of Putin. And because they see him as an advocate for going back to traditionalism, moving back to agrarianism, countering the new world order, the centralized bankers. What's your theory on that? Is he just a pawn in the overall technocratic regime or do you think he is an actual valid um sort of reactionary to the this technocratic control grid well uh a simpler question to perhaps answer that or a way to get at that is that obviously the war with russia goes back to and this is a key the game the game that i'm saying the greatest game uh that's going on is the game for control of your consciousness so we should begin to perceive the world in those terms this is the greatest game there's no you're in a game and so not a simulation you can you have the analogy of a simulation you're in a game and the game is to control your consciousness so everything is subsidiary to that however that's going to happen uh, and that's why you remember the british were engaged in india uh, israel 
Afghanistan as part of the great game in the 19th century, uh, around the same time as the computer, computer the computers, etc., and science was, uh, was developed. So this is going on. In the Crimean War, there was 30,000 Irish people fighting over there. Ridiculous. And, and people have forgotten about this. Um, so fighting for the British Empire, you know, no interest in them. But I mean, people, people didn't have a lot of options, and particularly after the, the, the famine and that. So, um, and that's what they do. They'll get the poor people from other countries to fight in the United States against its own population as well. Um, so uh, there's no question that this was set up by the interference of, of the West in these areas. I, I did some work in Moldova, and I was very aware of the tensions between the old Russian and, 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 and uh, the more European look. And it was clear to me that it was. But this was a this was a setup. There's no question about that. There is the concern that Putin was associated with the uh, World Economic Forum and there might be some uh, game going on there as well. That that, that danger uh, is, is always there. But in contradistinction, one factor which you cannot ignore is the power of neo-Trotskyism in the United States. And Trotskyism uh, is defined really by the ability to morph into different things. So people you don't think are Trotskyists are Trotskyists. And that was the key innovation. So uh, so you had people like uh, uh, in Reagan's government who were very, very interventionist. They were Trotskyists beforehand. You know? And the question is, of, if, you're, if you're a Trotskyist, can you ever not be a Trotskyist? It's a difficult question. When they say, you know, we're going to enter. So Christopher Hitchens, of course, was a Trotskyist. And people believe that he was a great free market uh, uh, person. They don't interpret what he said in those contexts. Uh, his brother, Peter Hitchens, was a Trotskyist. They, he explained, Peter Hitchens, who appears to be a conservative now, uh, although he was there getting the job first queued up. Um, so he, he said that their belief was that you had to wade through a sea of blood to come to paradise. Now, he's, he's just explaining. And, and Hitchens, Christopher Hitchens shared this view as well. So he managed to convince people that he's a great intellectual. And this is the same as in the United States. You go back to weathermen and that they were willing to kill millions of people, some of the people associated with that, in their coming to, uh, to, to paradise. And these people are still there. So when we come back to Putin, uh, the ex there's an extra bit of it and a supernatural bit. And this goes back to all the apparitions, uh, going back to Fatima, uh, up to Garabandal, um, right through it, Russia is critical. Now, remember... Fatima, one of the most amazing events to occur in the parapsychological, if you want, or supernatural domain, recorded, uh, you know, there's buckets of evidence about that. The, we, the phenomenon can't be. But that was all about Russia. So the argument, the point was that, and this was the parallel to the growth of communism, that what would happen in Russia uh, had to be stopped and Russia had to be converted. If it didn't, its sins would be spread to the world. Now, that's interpreted as atheistic materialism. So it, that would spread to the world. So when, by the time we come to Garabandal, the girls, and I met one of them, I've talked about it recently, the girls are saying when they, when they have this visitation, uh, apparition, what's communism mean? Uh, and they, the Virgin Mary says that the world will be taken over by communism. The world, not, not, not just... Uh, so that would be the spread of the errors and if we go back in catholic doctrine uh, there's a syllabus and errors in 1863 at the time that uh, that the virgin mary in another in another uh la salette said that there was a a legion of demons least uh, unloosed in the world according to one of the secrets in 1863 um which is interesting so in this one russia is critical in some other Catholic prophecies by mystics in the 19th century, what was predicted, a very interesting one, was that Russia would invade Europe with a Muslim force and take over, uh, take over most of Europe. Paris, M M Marseille would be destroyed, um, and then there would be some kind of fight back uh, at that stage. But that was so. So so Russia has. Now, so, so the, the problem in this is you have to presume that Russia is the aggress uh, aggressor, but the West is forcing this. So the West is clearly wants Russia to expand. And at a certain point, it will have to. And of course, it could use the 
the Muslim states, uh, you know, we're, we're heavy mo Muslim population to take over Europe, you know, for, for its uh, caliphate, et cetera, and solve another problem. But they say, well, if you don't want to be that traditional and enlightened Christian, con you know, you know, go your own way, but we're going to stay. So, so that possibility is there. It's these prophecies never happen in the way that you're, you're going to happen. But the key difference is the Trotskyists were always anti-Russian. That was the defining thing, because, of course, they were thrown out of Russia and they wanted Russia back for a different reason. So you have a lot of intellectuals in the United States, um, including people like Richard Rorty, who are Trotskyists and pe these people that you wouldn't, you know, so and in that embedded in that was a deep, hostile, anti-Russian feeling. So this is this is right up through the Council of Foreign Relations. This this the, the, this uh, hatred of Russia and they said Stalinism, but it was a, it was a deeper thing. They wanted to get Russia back. And remember in the Spanish Civil War that the Trotskyists were fighting against the Stalinists. The communists were fighting against each other. And remember as well, people like Tony Blair, Trotsky was one of their heroes. A lot of these people uh, came from a background which was extreme left. But what Trotsky's entryism meant was that you could enter into corporate context and achieve the games. That's why I believe so many of the left anti-globalization movement said, OK, we're in favor of globalization. Globalization is a good thing. We're in favor of good corporate because they could achieve the objectives through uh, control of corporations. So the, the, to answer the question, uh, to some extent, uh, Putin is caught in a, a a bigger historic and even supernatural game that the the uh, the growth of Christianity, of course, in Russia is a thing that can't be tolerated by the new world order because religion, family, nation state can't exist. So they don't want the growth of a a, a, a Christian population that could have some Im impact. So so that's a serious thing. And uh, there's also a prophecy at Garabandal that when the Pope goes to, to Russia, that, that would be the initiation of certain events and he has a, or goes to Moscow. So uh, there's a bigger game going on. A lot of people don't believe in these things, but actually having studied those things, particularly in France, there's a lot of things in France, and that's where I believe the source of the prob problem is. When you go back to Joan of Arc, for example, and again, there's quite decent historical records, I believe that she, was, she wasn't fighting against the English. She was fighting against this power structure, which is directly connected to the thing today. So to some extent, uh, in some ways, it's a, it's a bit like, not the Judas figure, but the argument that certain figures have to play a certain role in the thing that's beyond their hand. The paradox may be that there's more communism in the West than there is in in Russia at yes. this stage. And people don't understand yeah. that. People don't understand that they're living in uh, something which is utterly con utterly consistent with elements of Marxism. What it's not consistent with is the original humanity that Marx and Engels had when they went around, they saw the poor Irish people. Uh, in fact, you know, they were very dr driven by what happened in Manchester. Engels came to Ireland. He came to the slums in London uh, and he was driven by a humanity, but he also said, this is why humanism is important. He said that the human had to be made in the future. So it was in the future that was going to happen. So that, that's a, that's a, that's a, a long uh, rambling answer. There's, there, is, there is something up to play for this. And actually, there's some, it's a supernatural factor because uh, I so, believe there will be some kind of supernatural intervention uh, uh, so, in this as well. Yeah. It, if I could ask a question, James, um, you know, I believe that uh, every country, of course, has a destiny based on its role in the plan as a planetary body. Uh, America, for instance, and we're not uh, going into some kind of uh, American political alliance or something, but it yeah. on a larger level, it is the heart of the world. And there's a lot of evidence as far as why that is. And if America is captured then of course it has great implications spiritually and otherwise on everybody in the entire world and if i just sit back and look at russia at the same time it appears to me that there's always been an important nexus between america before it was totally compromised and when i say america i'm talking about the u.s and and not uh, suggesting that our canadian friends and uh 
friends south of the border aren't Americans either, but the, the U.S., you know, right in the heart of the three Americas. Um, and I believe the real game goes really supersedes beyond political figures, Putin's or, or, or political agendas or anything. So what's the long game here? Because these folks behind the, the transhumanism movements are really about inverting or uh, controlling the destiny that was uh, the natural design of our realm. And if you could, I guess my question is, is could you respond at all on that level, the role that Russia is as far as the planetary body and why uh, forces are stacked against them now um, and not just, uh, you know, limited to historical events and wars and, and different political agendas? Yeah. If that well, you have sense. this oppositional thing, like there's a joke about, you know, God saying to, to uh, Irish people and the first Irish people are oh, here, here's the, you know, you've got everything green, the lovely rain and your know, land that is fertile and all this in an island and uh, etc. Uh, and at the end of the story, of course, but you're beside these, these the British, you know, and, and no offense <laughs> to the British people, it's about powers. Because of course, uh, we're not, when they say Anglo-Saxon, the Anglo-Saxon were oppressed by the by the Normans as well, which is what Robin Hood was about and all that. So we can't always simply right. talk about power structures. So Ireland has an oppositional role in relation to this empire. That, that's what it has been doing for mm -hmm. uh, nearly uh, nearly a, a thousand years. So it has a bit of experience at dealing with this empire, which I believe is the root of it. And that's that's what its role mm -hmm. was, and as well as. Uh, when Christianity was, you know, fallen, uh, when there was volcanoes, etc., in, in the year 536, 540, it was Irish monks and that, and the Druids, I believe, that became monks that brought uh, the uh, culture Latin uh, back in the ninth century. It was only a few Irish monks that could translate the Greek manuscripts from the uh, Neoplaton, etc. So they had that role. And Russia has an oppositional role in relation to the United States, but not necessarily in the way that we think. If we go back to uh, the First World War in New York, there's a book called The Dark Invasion. And I read it because the, the, the hero of the story was a fellow called Inspector Tom Tunney. And, and of course, there's, you know, there's, there's a lot of, and his family came from Ireland. And he's believed to be the first head of, of, of Homeland Security in the United States, because he was an inspector in the police. And... Yeah, people forget there was a German underground movement in New York. So they were blowing up ships in the harbor, etc. So they began to go undercover and find out who these guys were and prevent things being happening and protect New York and, and protect America. And there was a huge German spy ring in New York. Um, at the end of his book, and he, I think there's a, it's free, his own version of it is free on, on the internet, as far as I remember, to be able to copyright. At the end of the book, he's a bit confused because Trotsky, the Trotsky gang that they'd been watching in New York were going over to, uh, to Russia with loads of money from the banks in New York. So uh, they were going over, they were financed, of course, from New York. And he's wondering, well, why are they going, why are these people being let go? Why are they, because the boat was stopped and all that, you remember interesting story that came from new york that came from the financial centers of new york so that pair that that takeover of the normal movement a very idealistic movement in russia came from the west and they they went they lenin comes up they get they, they come to stockholm another center in the thing and they get more you know uh, agreements there uh let me go let me let me let me come back to the london point just just to, just to really drive drive this home and, and, and if you give me a few minutes to explain this it will it will explain some of the connections no please uh, do yeah right uh, now bear in mind that when I, I have a few books there in post humanism and they're from the same publisher uh and when I went to the university library there recently, I put a few books on, on posting from the same publisher. And the publisher is based in, Blooms, in Bloomsbury. So I want you to think about, I want you to think about this uh, for a second. You have the British Museum in, in North Central uh, London, British Museum, okay? And the British Museum is beside Russell Square. 
And all around the area is the kind of University College London, which was the different from Oxford and, and Cambridge. It was the kind of uh, non-religious, uh, the non-religious place. So you have the British Museum. Beside it is Russell Square, UCL with, with, with Senate House. Just north of that, five-minute walk of Euston Station, 10-minute uh, walk of King's Cross Station. Okay, so all the area that I'm talking about, we could get there in 10 minutes anywhere from the British Museum. Okay, now, uh, where did Lenin meet Trotsky? He met him in a house near King's Cross. First time he ever met him. Where did Marx study? He studied in the reading room in the British, Mu in the British Museum. Where did the Bolsheviks form? They formed in London, in this area. The newspaper came from there. They all congregated uh, in London, as they had done in, in the United States. Um, so you can say, of course, they did, they did, because that was the center of empire. You know, it's natural in some way, but it, it, it kind of begins to it, it kind of begins to get a bit con uh, a bit confused. Um, Bernal, who I've mentioned before in the 1920s, who wrote The World of Flesh and the Devil, who explained that in the future, humans would become made of silicon, they would be transformed, or you'd live in the human zoo. He was a Stalinist, crystallographer, the really father of DNA in many senses. The DNA crystallography x-ray studies came out of him. He lived in, in, in Russell, Russell Square. Alistair Crowley lived there. Edgar Allan Poe lived there, just off of Oh, Russell interesting. Hmm. Yeah. Um, um, Mary Shelley, five minute walk away from uh, from there. H.G. Wells lived there. They're all they're all in this area. Arthur C. Clarke said he became he became convinced of this kind of uh, his vision of the future, and that was the vision, of course, H.G. Wells, New World Order. Here in a lecture at Senate House, uh, all, loads of dystopias come from around there. So. This building was informed the Ministry of, uh, of Truth in Orwell. Dystopia comes from London. The word dystopia yeah. was used by J.S. Mill to describe policy in, in, in Ireland. And if we go back, to, you could start off the Fairy Queen. That, that came about from Edward Spencer and what they were doing in Ireland. It begins to come in through the, the horror begins to come into public consciousness. So dystopia in London, of course, we have our, uh, Aldous Huxley. Was, so it's the Bloomsbury area, in other words. Uh, Virginia Woolf, all these suffragettes, feminist movement, socialist movement, a lot of theosophy around there, a lot of the esoteric movement, co-freemasonry was critical, Annie Besant. Uh, we can all look at Yeats lived around there. Um, so we have this the, the anthropology in its modern form, Psychology, British psychology came from there. The term psychic forces came from 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 Russell Square. All of this stuff comes uh, comes from uh, a same cluster. Uh, uh, Edgar Allan Poe, um, as, I, as I said, lived there. So what's he interested in? He's interested, as they say, in the cryptographic imagination. Uh, and we have in the British Museum, we have the mummies. We have the Egyptian base, which, of course, is upper class, is fascinating with the empires. And we have this idea of the significance of cryptography, you know, of course, applied in the context of uh, translating these things. But code is critical because code is associated with magic, is associated with power. This is where the British London Mathematical Society came from. This is where they got the great Indian uh, mathematicians over to help in this thing. This is where statistics uh, comes from, from from this area. Um, so what we have is a, uh, a movement towards knowledge, but it's knowledge of a particular type. It's knowledge associated with control of populations and in particular control of the mind. This is where the Tavistock Clinic came from, which came the Tavistock uh, Institute. It's there mm -hmm. on the square. This is where Carl Jung to came to lecture on his, uh, on his, um, his idea. This is where Sigmund Freud gave his lectures. He lived in North London, people forget. So we have Freud, Marx, Wells, the whole lot of them associated uh, with this area. Fabian socialism, uh, John Maynard Keynes, economics. They're all there. They're all the British Empire. And of course, the British Empire was saying, well, 
how are we going to how are we going what are we going to do in the future now we can't be all these fellas you know once they got the dynamite and they're you know because the, the irish fenians once they got the dynamite they blew up scotland yard and they started you know they started applying that in a political uh, context so over a period of time the british empire and particularly with wells they said we're going to change our form we're going to change into a combination of communism and capitalism to achieve uh, global control and they realized Leo uh, Zillard, who came up with the idea of the chain reaction. This, this is quite incredible. He came up with it, crossing the traffic lights on Southampton Row beside Russell Square. He was going to the British Museum. And that's where the idea of the chain reaction came from. A, a few hundred yards from where um, Edgar Allan Poe used to live. Not, not all the time, but he, he lived there. It's also beside... The British Patent Office, where the modern patent office came, where the modern intellectual property, patents, copyright, trademarks, really gr grew up in, again, walking distance. So these, if one comes and then sees a fragmented, pixelated idea of a separate system, they get a wrong idea. But one crucial bit, when we look at psychology and what they were doing and experimentation, there's William Sargent. And William Sargent... Uh, was critical in relation to the idea of mind control before it gets to the United States. He, he is a key point. So what happened was they had loads of people, loads of men from the First World War that were traumatized. They had something like 200,000 men that couldn't function because of what they'd seen. And they were, the, they were obviously the sane ones because, you know, how could you take this as normal, what was going on? So they had 200,000. So they started experimenting on, on them to say, well, what can we do with what can we do with these guys? So they, they were injecting them with so this is where barbiturates and amphetamines and all the stuff that you got in California, supposedly, you know, naturally, they were they were coming from there. They began to study mind control. And he published a paper in 1940, I think it was. And what happened then, they had loads of people come back from Dunkirk and they were they were traumatized. So again, he was saying, Well, what can we do? And they began to experiment a bit more. And he realized that trauma was the basis of, and if they could manipulate the trauma, they could, and he believed to get them to reenact uh, the situation, they could have an abnegation and they could deal with it that way. And he published his paper and the war office then said, you, you, you can't publish anymore. And it was integrated into the system that became the empire of the mind. He also gives us some clues about what was going to happen in the future. For example, they studied the African tribes and they realized that the old guys kept the younger guys uh, in the power structure by exhausting them, by getting them to dance all night. And once they were exhausted, they weren't going to rebel. So, I mean, if you think, if one thinks that these, you know, ecstasy movements and all that were organic and all that, uh, I, I don't think that's the case. They know that. That's why they were able in the 80s and that, and why it was so powerful, I believe, these movements, they don't happen of their own, own accord. So uh, Sargent was the basis of a lot of the experiments that happened in uh, Canada and uh, in America. And Huxley, of course, came from the Bloomsbury, uh, the Bloomsbury set, as did Gerald Heard. He was in that set as well, going to the United States. and uh, uh, explains uh, some other things. So what I am saying is that the in the empire of scientism, as I as described, going back to Huxley and evolutionary theory and all that, came up with the idea that they would control the human mind through prosthetic forms and what I call the regime of the made mind. Uh, in parallel to developing other intelligent systems, they would control the human mind and ultimately totally control uh, the human mind. And this was anticipate or signaled by a lot of the dystopian things they were telling the dystopian writers were telling us what the main policy is all the major dystopian writers really came from london they had an association with london and even back this weird peter pan was based around russell square it's ridiculous yeah. um uh and, and or orwell certainly was and and, and hooks all the great dystopian writers have a connect it keeps going back to the the british museum even in thomas pynchon I don't know what we call dystopia. They're, they're congregating in the British Museum, and he has that book about um, gravity's rainbow, etc. There's a constant reference, and they keep on showing that there's a there's a, a power because the ruling class in Britain had a genius 
for, for, for a number of things. They, the, the one genius they had is rules, the construction and utilization of rules in law, in games, associations, and of course, in relation to machines. So that's what Turing is translating that knowledge into a, a practical form and explaining, therefore, how that can be used in relation. The cybernetics, the ratio club, where Turing and all the buddies come together, zoologists, etc., just after the war, where does it meet? It meets in Russell, Russell Square at, at Queen's, at, at the Queen's Hospital, which was the neurological, um, neurological hospital. So the, the study of nerves was so they would be able to develop the control of the nervous system of the human body, I believe. Although, of course, they were performing therapeutic purposes. I'm not saying they're all in that, but one aspect of it. So cybernetics was there. The major universities in the United Kingdom was 23 or something, formed the Russell Group because they, they were formed there. Harry Potter comes from uh, the, 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 the publishing, the story was, was published from. It's ridiculous. So there's a continuity that some of the other horror writers, for example, uh, Arthur Macken wrote The Great God Pan. And what's that about? It's about a surgeon performing an operation on a person so the person could access their higher spiritual consciousness. This was, was going on. And it goes again, it goes back to what, what Mary Shelley is anticipating, that they're going to use this knowledge to try and get at the spirit uh, of the human. So uh, Poe was so so also if you look at some elements of Poe, he was ex he was uh, also exposing the mechanical Turk, for example. What's that? An, auto an automatic one that they're pretending is human, the same as they're doing the exact same thing as they're do they're doing today. You know, oh, this machine is human. You know, it's, it's has human capability when it doesn't have, and he's exposing that. Um, so the combination. So so the Crypsis is this fascination with secret stuff, the crypt. Horror comes from the crypt. Secret societies go on the crypt. Skull and bones, etc. association with that. It's the stuff they're keeping hidden. There's a there's a sculpture in, in the headquarters in Virginia, the, the CIA, I think. Uh, it's called a crypt, crypto, uh, cryptos, cryptos, the Greek for this, hidden. The Trotskyists often use Crypsis. So crypsis is camouflage, what animals do to pretend, you know, to, to blend in with their environment. This is what a lot of the extreme left has done, uh, is to blend in with the environment. So you don't know that it's crypsis. Uh, cryptography is the essence of all these systems, crypto, etc. It's it's going back to this. And these are signals, as is the signal X. The X club was Thomas Henry Huxley. Galton had his had his eugenics lab in russell square when well, james you know Price it's not interesting james i'm just thinking of this the city of london in and of itself is a corporate entity that goes back thousands of years that is you know many say there's like the three centers of the new world order it's the vatican uh the city of london and washington dc it's interesting that all of this seems to be coming in terms of the policy of the transformation of the reality is coming from that hub. I Many mm. you say the Vatican, of course, is sort of where it's coming, the spiritual hub, control hub. And then you have the Washington, D.C., which is sort of the military mm. hub. So just a, uh, clarif yeah. a clarification on that. Uh, and for people that don't understand, the city of London is the old part of London, the Roman part around yep. St. Paul's, which is, a, I know, you know, a separate, a separate corporation. It's the longest. Uh, now, this is not going to do for your viewing numbers, because anytime I've mentioned that the numbers, uh, the, uh, <laughs> your video will get hidden. Sorry. But uh, <laughs> the city of London uh, was, it's believed to be the longest self-governing system in the world, still standing in the world. When William the Conqueror came over, he left that alone. He, di he didn't overthrow the city of London. Uh, and that's, of course, you can know, sort of Freemason, a whole lot was set up there, all, all that kind of, we can go into that. So it's a bit north where we go to find this area around the British Museum, which is kind of the yeah. occult center. So what, what it's like is that this is part of the the world brain that they're talking about, okay? You know, so so the idea of, of the internet, you know, supposedly associated with CERN and all that, goes back to the world brain of um, of uh, H.G. Wells 
And so when Prescott Bush, that's the boy's name in the United States, was talking about his Memex system, they're talking about this world brain system. So what I believe is, so we have these two separate areas that are, are, are critical in London, the city of London, and this area, which I, I say is very important. And that area is associated with a number of things, not least the political thing, but it's also associated with the occult. You have the magic shops there. This is where they used to go and buy their, buy their books. Uh, and it, it's still interesting. It appears, um, and actually, uh, it was where T.S. Eliot was based. The company that was bought over by Google, DeepMind, you can guess where its office is. It was on Russell Square. Now, okay, you say this is all coincidence. But <laughs> the city of London was about the international transactions, finance, and this is the yeah. transmutation. So alchemy is important, uh, as Bear has talked about. So what we're talking about is we're talking about an alch alchemical transformation of the human into something non-human, into the ghostly. This is, this is into steam, basically, into vapor. Um, vanish in the in, in the mists, uh, and the transmutation of the empire occurred into finance, commerce, all these places in the Middle East. The financial network that was set up by the city of London. That's a different type of transmutation. In addition to the military power, it's transmutation into a regulatory system. Um, and the area around the British Museum was always interesting. The occult in Egypt. Where does it go back to? It goes back to Babylon. I, I didn't really buy it initially. It goes back to Babylon. Uh, and why does it go back to Babylon? It goes back to Babylon because some of the key players have told us this. Arthur C. Clarke has told us this. And as I remember Babylon, he's hinted, he, he's made clear about this. Why does it go back to Babylon? See, I have a different view about what a lot of the, the biblical sto stuff is about, uh, about Genesis and about the story of, of, of the Jews, etc. What we have been led to believe is that the Jewish and the Christians, historically, uh, were in some way, were the uh, the ruling force. This is this is the implication that were left that they were in charge, monotheism or ruler. But actually, uh, Genesis came out of the captivity in Babylon, so the appeal to God or whatever was appeal to a higher force. So when you look at Arthur C. Clarke, now, so, so it's not it's not me saying this. These are the people that supposedly don't believe in this thing. Remember, of course, that uh, you know when you had Bush and Kerry, you know, from the Skull and Bones Club, stand up for president. You know, this thing about control of the school goes back to Babylon, Babylonian magic. It goes back to if you control the school, you control the spirit of the parents. There's a, there's a long history of necromancy uh, going in these things. So when, when um, writing about uh, Isaac Newton, uh, Keynes, the economist, said that Isaac Newton was the last of the magicians in, in a, a string going back 10,000 years to Babylon. That's how he, he, he contextualized what, what, what he was doing. They keep going back to Babylon. So Arthur C. Clarke indicated that what they were trying to do in recreating the Tower of Babel was exactly what Genesis told them, that God said that if they had been allowed the one language, they couldn't be controlled. Nothing would be impossible for them. So they listened more to the Bible than, than a lot of Christians do. So the belief is that if they go back, they can recover what they had in Babylon. A lot of the movement of finances going back to the Middle East in H.G. Wells, in his vision of the future, the new world is established in this key location, and Basra was one of the key locations. So you're, the, the money, the people you're paying tax for, you say, well, why are we fighting for Basra? Well, if you look at the new world order that George Bush Sr. declared, as well as the, you know, the other one, um, well, these are all in the plan. They want to control that area, and they're going home. So this, So for them... Judeo-Christianity was an oppositional force to it because in this, in their vision, they wanted to be able to do whatever they want, basically, without restraint. And I believe that that's, that's what a lot of the oppositional force is. And this continues in, in a kind of continuous line. I, I, I didn't believe it until these guys kept saying it when I looked at the history of science. And then when you come to, uh, it, it changes in, in subtle ways. When you come to Francis Bacon, the idea that became very clear in the Protestant Reformation 
was that uh, what was the consequence of being thrown out of the Garden of Eden? Well, the consequence was they uh, they were punished for their, their desire to have knowledge and they were punished by being ignorant. So the solution, therefore, to get back into the Garden of Eden was in knowledge. And that was the basis of, of it. Now, when we talk, we hear a critique of Abrahamic religions. If you read carefully New Atlantis, uh, well, the scientific elite is an Abrahamic religion because they trace their they trace their continuity back to Abraham, although they seem to be in oppositional to it. They're intensely, as you said, uh, bar, bear superstitious, intensely involved in this thing. So weirdly, it goes back to this. And I'll, then we say the one language. Well, what's the one language? It's obviously digitization. It's the reduction of everything. To you know, they talk about diversity. There's not, you know, mm -hmm. what diversity by eliminating differences. They were, were clear. They didn't want a homogenous population that would be able to resist them. So that's why they, they promote heterogeneity only for that purpose. So you can't have people that can communicate together to oppose them. But when they have the, the, the one, they are the gods. God, they believe what God said in Genesis, that, um, that they, nothing will be impossible for them. And Arthur C. Clarke has said this. So it's, that's consistent with the Promethean thing, which says, I'm fighting against Zeus and I'm going to rob them and I, you know, I have a right to do so. It's also consistent with Luciferianism, with Satanism, with, with all those things. They, they, they chime very well together. And associated with that, you had this strange fascination with these gods going back to there. Uh, Moloch, uh, we could put in Ariman, we could put in um, Baal. These guys that you know were displaced uh, you know, we're coming back and you can find them in Bohemian Grove. It's not an accident that these things are there. They have a deep you can connection. find them at, at CERN. Yes. Yeah. A deep connection to that. So these guys are, are coming back and associate with that. You have all this idea of, you know, uh, what some of the religious views as uh, Jews uh, were, were arguing against that this, there was this, that child sacrifice was an important part of, of this thing. And if you look at an article written by a famous article written by William Stead in 1885, it was called the, the maiden tribute to uh, modern Babylon. So where was Babylon? It was London. London was Babylon. What was he talking about? He was talking about mm -hmm. the disappearance and sacred, well, death of thousands of, of girls and children in London. He went undercover. And he was, I think, prosecuted because he bought a girl. It was very, very easy in London. Once you get an influx of people, a big migration, uh, children will, 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 will disappear. And that, that's one of the objectives, one of the reasons that uh, some of these people are in favor of that. And he linked that to, to Babylon. And he, 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 he explains that, the, or he b believes that the labyrinth, going back to Daedalus and all that, was... Uh, a context in which uh, to sacrifice uh, children. That's that's what the, what the thing was about. But this connection between London and Babylon is there. And actually, when you look at certain symbolism, Gog and Magog is a symbol of the city of London. It's quite, it still is this, you know. But this occult thing is really, really, really deep. And the city of London, the center where the, the, the Guild Hall is, is built. There's a Roman. It was a Roman encampment under the, the police station. Is based on an old Rome. It's, it's unbelievable. Uh, a Roman center. So when Philip K. Dick says, you know, the Rome, the empire never went away, he, he he was intuiting what is historically accurate that the empire did didn't uh, go away, and what they have been doing is trying and to displace any oppositional force, which is why they're against religion, any religion. Uh, against the nation state, against the family, which is why I defend them, uh, because th if they're against them, it's a good indication that there's something decent about them. Uh, they don't want any oppositional force because they will divide and conquer. Anything that they're elevating now, they will destroy. Anything that so so people think, oh, this this is coming up. This you know they they seem to be promoting Islam. Seem to be promoting. Uh, uh, if we go back to the Tao Te Ching. What you what you want to destroy, you you first extend, it's overextension as in judo, and then they will take it. They're, they're not doing this. I, I I I'd be very careful in, in in certain to believe that my interests are protected by these groups. They have no commitment to religion. They 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 may use it to 
create Islamic Christian tensions, for example, which is why I consistently urge spiritual people to unite and also not to be careful not to condemn other people with spiritual belief, to try and find common ground, to realize we have a common enemy, to suspend, have a ceasefire in relation to uh, what our beliefs are, not to be too quick to criticize the mass of people who don't share extremist uh, views, to find a common ground and realize we're under threat uh, and that people who who are committed to spiritual consciences, uh, every one of them are, 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 are under pressure. Um, so London is critical in relation to this, that the empire never really went away, it transmuted. Whether you ever got independence, I, 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 I'm not convinced that uh, that independence is as independent as you believe. It was necessary. <laughs> well, you had you, you had a tough time, the civil war, uh, but you were necessary in order to fund or to work to provide a military economy. Uh, a lot of prosperity was built on the manufacture of weapons. Uh, the First World War wouldn't have continued if they didn't have the American factories with open-ended contracts to produce. To, you say, well, why are they going in all the time? It's not getting anywhere. Well, there's money coming in one end and there's dead bodies coming out the, mm. uh, out the other end. So, um, and, and the military, we... industrial comp military industrial complex. No, I was just going to say, it, it... sorry. No, please just go the ahead. last point on that. The military industrial complex, yeah, of course, ahead. when they're setting up in Berkeley, they're setting up the university, they're saying, well, this is an extension of empire. And of course, that was used as a launch pad, knocking on the door of Japan. Here we, here we are, boys. Leave us alone. We want to continue. No, 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 no. We're here now. And 100 years later, you drop a bomb and you say, well, we, were, we weren't joking, boys, even when we didn't need to do. But this is not about the American people. Or about the, uh, it's about the power structures that are forming this global system. Utterly unscrupulous utterly willing to do anything. Uh, and I don't tell what I actually believe is the true story in its full extent. I don't give the, the, the grade of the nefariousness. I think that some of it is so bad that people, you know, they certainly haven't contemplated it, but it's much worse in relation. So that's why we have to wake up. I, I, I hope that kind of answered it or, or why I think London is critical in this and why we see like, post-humanism coming from some of these areas. Now, that was brilliant. Uh, very enlightening. I learned a lot through that. And I was just going to remark earlier that, uh, you know, I chuckle when we think we won the Revolutionary War. Uh, you know, we did put up a, a good kerfuffle, and, uh, and I think it was uh, beneficial in a lot of ways. But if we truly won, then how the heck did the British once again enter our shores and raise the the capital to the ground in 1812 and it just couldn't possibly happen if we're truly independent and if we defeated the British but those little things uh, you'd be hard pressed to find anybody coming out of uh, a US uh, college these days that knows our history and what actually went on then and then of course in the war of 1812 there was um, also, a lot of other things, uh, you know, not just getting invaded because we had the audacity to try to kick out a national bank, the first attempt to, you know, get that established in the U.S. But there's important documents and things also that had to be seized. So, yeah, we've uh, we've remained a colony from day one, as far as I can see. Yeah, once 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 what the British, another thing the British were, were brilliant at. And again, I'm not talking about the people, but the systems was the, the use of corporations and corporations, mm -hmm. of course, there were particular colonial corporations. Now, people get they oversimplified this in some conspiracy theory about this one corporation as if that's significant. But it was corporations that colonized. It wasn't religious. Religious people were taken, you know, were involved in the system, but it wasn't a religious colonization. It was a corporate colonization going back to uh, John Dee's plans and incredibly the state legislatures in, in, in the East Coast, their system of governance was the system of corporate governance transplanted into, into the uh, state. It's quite incredible for the Commonwealth uh, as it happened. So uh, the corporate element was there. And of course, we had the East India Company, which was, you know, which was uh, well, running the drugs trade, running India, et cetera, which the empire took over. But there were expert at using this corporate form. Many, of course, come to the city of London. Many of these theorists, uh, Mill and all that, worked in the city of London. They're all, they're all uh, involved uh, in, in the thing. And of course, 
the slave trade was fundamentally associated with that. But these corporate forms were, were critical because you can do things with corporate forms. And we forget about that in the spiritual world. No, I'm not talking about egregores, but just how powerful they are. And they believe that one of the reasons China didn't expand uh, so much was because it didn't have this form to, that could operate. Uh, so, so now we're faced with mega corporations, which are not subject. There's no antitrust or competition law to control them. Uh, so they can, they're, they're much bigger, as we know, than, 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 than countries. They can buy and sell them. They can capture all the regulators. So we're subject to the, these kind of geeky generals who have visions of creating God. And they're telling us with the AI that, that that's what they're doing. They're creating God. I mean, it's quite, it's quite they're straightforward on it. So uh, these are the people that are deciding our future undemocratically, uh, daft, uh, no, no philosophical, deep philosophical basis. Their, their theories go back to people like Feinberg uh, and the Promethean Project in the 60s, which explained that we need, that humans didn't have a, because we didn't have a, a purpose, we were accidental, we had to have a purpose. This was continuing on the British uh, imperial uh, eugenicist movement, and therefore we were moving uh, to the future in, in a constructed way. Any bad things in the human would be taken out of them. You know, they would be controlled. Uh, and the last point before I forget, and we have this symbolism of the X. Now, the X, in my view, is critical because, of course, it, it refers back to Jesus Christ. It refers back to a whole number of th uh, things. But essentially, it's based on the quincunx. It's based on, on, on the five, if you like, on a dice with a square and one in the center. And this goes back to ancient times uh, in, in a number of cultures. Uh, we see it in the Roman military forms. And the Normans were very interested that town structures were often based on a diamond, not, not a square diamond with something in the middle. It was this quincunx. It's, again and again, it's an association. So then we have this strange fascination with the number five, of course, which is indicated by that, with the pentagon and the pentagram and the MI5, which doesn't have to be MI5, even its secret name, Box 500, as it was, is five. It's, 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 it's an intense symbol in some way associated with, uh, with, with, with a, a dark sorcery because it used to be used as a defense against witches, etc. That, that was one of the ones that led to the prosecution of witches, not from the church, but from the king because he was afraid of these things. It goes back, there's a deep interest in that, uh, in, in the, the quincunx, in, in, in the system. And that's also the plantation system in California was based on quincunx. You put a tree down, and then you have a tree which is equidistant around in four directions, and then you have the lines out, and you can see along the lines. It's using the prison system. It's, it, was, it was a symbol that they extracted from the architecture of early Christianity, and they, which had a religious significance. In the Christian context, it was nine was the, was the holy figure. And they, they perceived, and they began to work, Leonardo da Vinci, etc., on this five. So, so this X thing, represents the new world order in some sense. I think it's the X which replaced the Christian era, which was due to end about 2,000 years after, in their head. I believe they intend, they've set these dates because it's 2,000 years after uh, Jesus. And this is the new X, which will be a technological thing. The X factor, the X, you see it again and again and again. Well, and you it's have Musk, it, Musk changing Twitter to X, and it's just like, honey yeah, trap, y'all, yeah, don't you see this? Take the words out of my mouth, Mike. <laughs> all of it. It's all, it's, it's just, uh, actually, even the the birth control, and I'm not against birth control, but the, but the birth control movement is Title 10, Title X. Uh, the case to change the law in Ireland, abortion is the X case. It, it, it's, it, it's just, when you look at it, you see it goes back to uh, Maltus was another guy. He didn't have much co co contact with London, but he did have a, some base outside the British Museum again, Malthusian theory. Uh, and, uh, so, so, um, and actually, you probably know this device, that you, it's a Galton board or something. They use it to indicate uh, a kind of a bell curve, a natural, how, how it forms. So you have this device, which is a, two bo or a board and a glass in front of it, and you have sticks arranged in a quincunx shape, and you put in some balls, 
and they will distribute themselves in a kind of bell curve naturally. Uh, and he uses that to, to make, to, uh, Galton used that to explain some of his theories about eugenics and all that kind of stuff. But the idea came to him because he was obviously fascinated with this five shape. It, it's there again and again. And also mesh wire is based on these, uh, on these. It's there again and again and again. They, they have this fascination with the five, with the X, with the quincunx. It, it's a deep idea. And at the last point, I believe that the, the nine is 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 the com the 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 antidote to that. I believe that ultimately the, the the number nine is the one that combats this five encloses that. So that would link back to Tesla and a lot of religious ideas, uh, etc. So well, it gets uh, back are... to it gets back to real science and and uh, the whole original design of creation that if we understood it then we would not at all be vulnerable to everything we're talking about exactly and also to know what's an antidote to their stuff or even even what they were afraid of these these power groups for example uh and this is why I, i'm very uh, you know I, i'm not as quick as other people to dismiss the the catholic history say in ireland the Norman rulers that were really involved in this, they were afraid of the Irish saints. They were really afraid of them. They had a deep fear, uh, as far as I can see, of figures like St. Bridget. Now, if they had a deep fear of these figures, I don't think we should forget them. You know, And they transformed, they inverted a lot of these figures in the Bridewell, etc., all around the world. Prisons for, for people refers back to the bride well in London, in the city of, just outside the walls of the city of London, which used, bride is another word for, for Bridget. Uh, it used to be a sacred place, and they transform it into a, into a, a women's prison. Henry VIII was in the Bridewell Palace at the, when he started the Reformation in Britain. It, it, it's unbelievable. These things are not uh, accidental forces. Swedenborg lived around there as well, it, 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 just on, on the edge of the city of London. Uh, and Blake w w was not far away. So, so all all of this. Now, remember Swedenborg, of course, who had his mystical experience in London. Um, he is the father of arguably American transcendentalism, but certainly spiritualism. All that spiritualism in Brazil. Father of the New Age, in a way. Yeah, and and Kardec, etc. It goes back to um, it goes it goes back to uh, to London. You know, I mean. Uh, how much evidence does one need about the transference of, of of ideas and all those figures? Benjamin Franklin is working in a, in a printer's office, and, and, and you can locate all these things back to to, to, to these contexts. So um, once you once you you begin to, so, so what I was saying was that the London the imperial structure as transmuted is equivalent to the executive function in the human brain on a mass scale. So in the world brain context, the executive function that we would have was based in certain areas in London. The transactional force, the operative force, again, was based in London. So this is part of the construction of a macro entity as well. So a new Adam, a new a new. What, what kind of Blake was talking about in spiritual terms, like the recreation of some giant force as well. So I really believe we have to think of, well, what's 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 driving the, what is the decision-making process of this totality? You really have to come back and, and look at the cognitive function as manifest in the historical evidence uh, to, to begin to get a sense of what the picture is on a macro level that we can't work out by looking at all the parts. Um, and if you go, uh, you know, we'll just make a comment about Steiner and, you know, his understanding. If you isolate the skull, you know, which basically is in neurology and in old school alchemy, we, we think of that as the, the North Pole. And also, um, you know, just uh, kind of the, the whole neurology when it comes down and functions in the body then it in uh, biologically speaking it works through neurotransmitters that as soon as they have done their job they're spent so um, neurology basically ends in death unless as steiner understood 
there's a metabolic or south pole that can receive those impulses and then give life back so that it's a two-way uh a two-way street so life is perpetually renewed rather than just things coming from you know that solidified skull structure and then all those impulses just basically going into a void without being re revivis revivified and that of course uh you know as far as i can see is really the whole goal is to separate those two poles so that we do not have the access for constant renewal and self-creation and and autonomy so um yeah i mean we could pick apart all these things uh you know in great detail and and if you look at anything from from uh, physics to biology and you know whatever perspective uh, you know Gerta, they they're they're all looking at the same thing you know we have to incorporate both poles of our senses in order to really have the ability to investigate what's going on in the first place to be true empiricist so with all this being said and since we're kind of coming up on time a little bit i'd like to leave it with uh maybe what's your prognosis um you know a lot of the the schools of thought that I follow, uh, you know, that go back way, way, way back, they keep repeating the same statement uh, in reference to this time historically that we find ourselves in, and that is for those who will be left. So um, it really sounds ominous, maybe for about half the population that, uh, you know, has succumbed for whatever reason. And, uh, but then, for those that make a different choice, then it's it's not the end. So we do still have a choice. And what do you think? Where are we going with all this? There's no question. And that, that's exactly, uh, this is the time of choice. Uh, Agar Bandal, one of, the, uh, one of the messages was that there would be an illumination of conscience of the whole world, meaning that you would see yourself as God sees you, which I interpret as a collective near-death experience, which makes sense if we're, if we're coming at the end of humanity. Uh, but that still leaves you with the choice. So what the choice is, is very, very clear. You either understand that you are spiritual consciousness, which is incarnated, uh, or you have some other conception of yourself, where there's some other priority. Uh, and I believe that people that don't commit themselves to the spiritual consciousness to understand who they are, um, they will uh, they will have a they will they will suffer. Uh, they will suffer uh, on a different level. We can all suffer in physical form. That's one level of suffering, but it's not the ultimate suffering. The, the ultimate suffering is where you lose control of your 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 spirit. That that that's it. So I mean, uh, in Ireland, and my father's uncle, for example, was in in jail with a fellow who who then had a, a, a world famous hunger strike, you know, seventy days, whatever, you know, and that's suffering when you when you do that for a cause, particularly. But he was a, a religious chap, and he wouldn't believe that that was the end of matters. So that people are able to endure uh, horrendous suffering uh, to do so. Uh, there's also the question of fear, and fear is obviously the fuel of these groups. Uh, people that are, believe in the spiritual thing and are committed to a higher force are not going to be afraid of that, and they will encounter death uh, rather than sell their soul. So uh, the thing about being left uh, it distinguishes people who make a choice in favor of their own spiritual consciousness. And I believe that that's very, very simple. It's like in the uh, some ways in the Hindu context where it's just like that, where you commit yourself to a spiritual consciousness. You say I, I'm this, and I'm not, and I'm not going to, I'm not going to have my rights or, or or my consciousness impaired by something because I am a reflection of the divine. Now I don't mean that in the limited sense that Jung meant it, because Jung, when he was talking about the imago dei, was often talking about a psychological representation. It's deeper than that. It's actually realizing whether you want to call it a fractal, a hologram, a, a spark of the divine. So that that we are that we have have this. You are that. All those basic things. So we are that. But there's intense forces now to convince you that you, you don't have. And it's very, very difficult for some people to understand that. And then some many people don't want to do it. And then many people say 
well, I'll take the chip. I'm not that bothered. Grand. Good luck to you. Uh, let uh, Take all those things. Um, and I'm not going to go around pointing the finger at them. You, or, you, the, you or the lethal injection, which uh, the most disturbing thing I hear from a lot of people that have uh, done that is that they say, I can't feel God anymore. And in that uh, comes a great sense of despair. I, I do feel... I do feel sad for people that have been codded and fooled. Uh, but what it points to is the necessity to be vigilant in relation to your own uh, consent. Because ultimately, uh, people consented. You know, uh, you know, people consented to the process. Now, I understand that there will, you can say, the, the duress and all that, and it's not total consent. But... Uh, insofar as there, there are consequences to these things. What, what I'm saying is that uh, this thing is a constant battle now. Steiner said that we're, humanity will always now face the threat of murder from machines. Yeah, Joe Rogan, you know, saying, um, oh, well, I believe the future of humanity is we're going to marriage with machines. I say, well, well, what can you do? It's inevitable. This is another argument they use. It's magic. It's inevitable. This is what they use to in, invade convince the Brits to invade Iraq. It's inevitable, you know, as if there's some magic word about this. So uh, we're being set up to be dependent on these systems now. Then they pull the rug out and we're more dependent. Then they pull the rug out and they have to get a chip. And and, and there's no question that, that those things. And, and, and then you're gone. And I believe that there's choices in all, the, in all those things. Um, the consequences will get, uh, will get more and more. But um, the, the good side is that the contrast is getting clearer and clearer to people. Because, I mean, a few years ago when things were going well, people might say, well, why are you interested, Bear, in all these things? You know, can you not just, you know, get the, get the plants and, you know, carry on and look a bit of football and all that? But the whole point is that all <laughs> these things are, are the fundamental mm -hmm. reality uh, and that uh, you can choose between their constructed reality and the diminishing returns therefrom and... The argument about a really dark kind of consequence of adhering to it, or you can recognize who you are, the the the, the spiritual light, uh, as I say. Now, a lot of people, I don't believe not. Well, you have to kind of also be willing to commit yourself to a spiritual path. You have to be willing to learn, and you have to be willing to do hard work and work things out and get beyond your your limited cognitive capacities as well. Because I know a lot of people. And they've never changed. They don't believe in anything about spirituality. They don't believe in any of it, not a bit of it. That's their choice. I'm not going to come. I know when I can't uh, convince that uh, when someone asks it, it's different. Um, but uh, it, it, it's getting so serious now that there are deep consequences. Uh, I believe we will. I believe it will be more and more that we will actually see demons more and more for people that haven't seen them or seen that they will actually see them in the future, that they will more and more materialize um especially uh, as society is going so um they're going to the the choice will become clearer and clearer uh, in some senses the problem is if you've committed yourself to a path that's inconsistent with this but again like in the christian terms the robber on the cross you know says i believe and, and then he's you know going to paradise it, it really is there is a simplicity beyond the rules which which we, we, which is indicating that you recognize your own divine consciousness, that you recognize as a great mystery, as, as, as the Native Americans describe it, that we can't comprehend the mystery, we can't manage the mystery, we have to succumb to it. As C.S. Lewis talked about the abolition of, ma of man, uh, that he, there, there's, there's two, uh, there's two or approaches. One can say, I'm going to control this environment, control the world, control the whole thing, or you can say, I'm going to succumb to the majesty the mystery uh, and adapt to it, which is the classic Taoist, uh, classic uh, uh, type of agriculture that you do. Uh, let this thing do its work. Don't try and superimpose your uh, yourself on it. Uh, let nature work, respect it, have respect for the inherent intelligence, intuition, functionality, consciousness in nature, uh, instead of trying to control it. And it's this left brain uh, approach uh, which cuts people down. So uh, I don't want to be, uh, I don't want to be grim in any of this. I'm, I'm, I'm not, not, but you, you're going to see it. I mean, you're going to see it today, tomorrow, the next day. There's a, you're, 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 we're now experiencing a permanent cultural revolution. Every day is going to be the same. 
what you believe tomorrow is going to be changed and wrong and what you believe the next day is going to be wrong and you're going to be persecuted for some of your views if you don't change so you, you can stand up now or you can stand up uh in the future and at a certain stage you won't be able to stand up and a certain the, the reduction the reduction is of from human to a dehumanized state uh, uh to an animal now they're talking about plants and ultimately to a mineral mineral form i mean that's what we were told by a uh, hundred years ago so you're going down the chain of being that that's what that's what the option is once you start off there's only one way you're not getting back up you've had enough uh, you know if you go over a certain threshold you're not coming back the other way around it's not about things you've done in your life or or about uh you know little things like that it's about your commitment to understanding who you are and then you can work on on, on the other detail uh, and what we are is light and and uh that that's our our nature and something that uh, they don't understand and something that they don't have and something that ai will never have but we do have it so uh they all people often say oh well ai can never be like humans yeah, it, it can't be like humans in that sense. It can't have spiritual light, but it can stop you having uh, spiritual light. It's like uh, Quentin Crisp, uh, who I met. I was at the stage in in in, uh, in London year or in Dublin years ago, giving talk. He was one of the first gays that came out, and he was you know uh, one of these flamboyant figures. And he used to say, "Don't try and keep up with the uh, uh, with the Joneses. Drag them down to your level." And that. Uh, attitude is the same in the spiritual context so we won't make ai the spiritual thing we'll drag you down to the mechanistic level and the spiritual thing will be gone or we'll give you an injection or we'll do something so that's what the struggle is the struggle is to maintain your spiritual conscience to believe in it to pay attention to the different traditions to learn from perennial philosophy not to be too critical about the thing to to, to look at the best constructions where we can uh not to oversimplify the history to make sure you know the history because a lot of people don't haven't read the history actually they spout what the system gives them about religion spirituality whatever whatever way you find that way to express your spiritual consciousness and then distinguishing between strategy and tactics this is the thing that they do all the time they're very big on tactics so they will do something which doesn't appear to be consistent with their strategy but it's a tactical thing tony blair was always going on about this but the opposition also has to have strategy and tactics. And the main tactical thing that's important at this uh, period is not to judge people on the basis of the type of spiritual belief they have, unless it's something which is utterly inconsistent with any good thing. But if they have some kind of belief or some kind of spiritual base, just try and unite at a higher plane. Try and unite at the commonality of a shared spiritual potential and Put aside our our our, our cognitive and uh, weapons on on the things, and and because everyone is under threat on uh, on this. So tactically, we have to be a bit wiser. We have to grow up a bit as well. We have to be a bit careful that we, when we're making critiques of certain traditions, that we know what we're talking about. Because a lot of the stuff is 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 not accurate when you begin to look at it. Uh, we have to inform ourselves of some of the history. Subjects like legal history, nobody talks about legal history. You cannot understand the modern world without understanding legal history, for example. It's a topic that's not even on the agenda. Um, and some people believe that why Marx went wrong was because he didn't understand what happened in the English legal system beforehand. So there's all these complexities. Ultimately, uh, recognize our spiritual con uh, conscience and then be disciplined. We have to apply an, an, a, a martial arts kind of disciplined philosophy in order to uh to cut away the excess to focus on things that we know are true pragmatic and that work uh, and be very very disciplined and also in our argument not to be dragged into arguments that they are that they are presenting to us they're throwing in loads of things they're sending in people that are uh, red herrings and, and that are designed to take us off the scent uh, and uh, people that are not what they appear to be uh, and there's a lot of distortion going on. So we have to be careful to focus on the true signals. And the true signals can only be vindicated by your own deep intuition, as Steiner was, was talking about. Yeah. I think it's important to note uh, or maybe distinguish between shrewdness, which these folks are extremely shrewd and they yes, have a yeah. long history of these kinds of agendas, uh, which is much different, though, than authentic intelligence and uh, creative ability. So 
if we think of a lot of these uh, public figures that seem so dark and evil, they've crossed that threshold themselves a long time ago. And so they need our juice. They need our energy in order to implement what they're trying to do. And just bring it back on that final note, because I believe we still hold all the cards and we, again, goes back to choice. Do we give our energy to create their world or use our energy for our own aims and goals? So um, no matter what, we're the ones creating the world. (laughs) <laughs> so yeah. that they require us. So either are we going to be tricked yeah. into creating the world they want, or are we going to take back the power and create the world we want? Uh, you know, we have the conscience, con science, conscience is the real science. And that is in all of us. And that is directly connected to the source, to God, creator, whatever you want to call it. Go to your conscience. If you go to your conscience, it will lead you in the right way. And that's right. The small voice, uh, Elijah, whatever. That, that small voice is what is, is what all mystics have. All the small, still voice. And uh, the only problem is that we have to recognise that there are certain places where, as Tom Waits put it, a royal flush never beat a pair. You know, so that they're stacked against you. What you have to be careful about is 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 being sucked into institutions, movements where that is the case, where the table is tilted, where it's set up mm. already. And that's why I encourage individuals of their own free will beginning to align that we learn off each other. Uh, we don't compel anyone else to, to, to do anything. We don't force them to have certain views. We're suggestive, respectful, respect for the, the history, the tradition, the people that have been doing this work uh, like you have been doing, shown a, shown the relevance of this applying it in a, in a way that I don't, you know, apply in a real world situation because I'm trying to look at the analysis. But people do different things. We fly in a murmuration that is informed by our choice to go on paths where other people better than us, who are aligned in the same way, can indicate, uh, and we form uh, a non-violent, invisible army, uh, which is across the way where people don't. We also have to apply apply some of their some of their um, techniques. For example, when I was in academia, I used to go out in different domains and present papers and things like sociology and political science outside law to to get an idea what was going on. And I found myself in certain contexts being with groups of people who were talking about things that I'd never heard about, and that sounded ridiculous. But I remember being with a group of criminologists and they were talking about hate crime now i was just listening because i'm a good listener got big ears there but uh so uh and they were talking about this thing called hate crime and again i didn't i didn't react to it if i had gone that direction i would have seen the hate crime right from its in and what it was and where it came from and all that kind of stuff these are the point is that sometimes you just have to listen and listen and notice what's going on and those people that listen and notice they might be it might be a delivery man or woman it might be someone cleaning a house it might be someone all those people can learn things we can all learn by looking at what's going all these people that we're talking about they live in the same world they're dependent on the vast majority of people they have people that that have access that look after their that look after their their world this was historically the way the guerrilla wars operated the reason why they changed the population for example in a place like ireland is so you can't have a guerrilla war because you need the community support. But so now what happens is the community happens on a different level, on a non-violent level, and they begin to learn things. That's why we, we do have a few more whistleblowers come out, like Schellenberg is publishing about the combination with the British and the Americans in relation to, again, going back to Britain, uh, the trusted news initiative goes back to Britain, yeah, the control of the uh, social media. There's people all uh, involved in all these things. What we have to advocate as well is that you're selling your soul to the devil for this one. This is the Faustian pact you're involved in. You know, so uh, we can't have a whole lot of whistleblowers coming out and don't send anything to me. I have enough things to be doing. But we can get a better picture of the world if people realize what the game is. The game is control of your consciousness, our consciousness, your children's consciousness. Whatever short-term benefits you get, whatever 
separation you believe you have from the rest of the world at a certain point, you come to account for that. In the natural law, you, I believe, will come to account for these things. You will see the consequence of your action. You can make yourself willfully blind to those consequences, uh, but you'll have to own them, and you'll own them, you'll own them longer then you'll own the material rewards that you get because you'll lose them. There's no pockets and shroud. You won't be carrying them to the next world, but you'll be carrying your choices and your karmic decisions. Uh, and certainly, this is the Judas we're, we're facing. This is the Judas era in the, in, in, in the Steinerian thing. We're going through the Judas era, era, and we have a Judas class. And the Judas class, they will suffer their own pain. We don't need a hell for them. They, they, they'll suffer their own pain when they realize what they have sold out. Now, Judas, the last point on Judas, he's very, very interesting. Uh, he's been a fascinating figure for a lot of artists, and artists have probably realized the Judas element in them. But the main story that's relevant about Judas, and it's very relevant to Christopher Hitchens, is what does Judas do when he sees Jesus getting effectively a massage or having his feet massaged with a pound of ointment of spike nard? Uh, so... He protests because he's the person looking after the, the money. He protests that this, this money that Jesus had, the woman the woman decided to apply, this expensive ointment, give him a massage or whatever you want to call it, uh, his feet. He protests that this money could be used for the poor. So he's Jesus saying, okay, you know, go, go ahead. And obviously in his capacity can make that decision. But Judas says, no, I want to use this money for the poor. And this is the exact same thing that Christ Christopher Hitchens says about Mother Teresa. What a terrible woman. She didn't care about the poor. The same same old argument. All these, argu all these arguments about the poor, and they have no concern about the poor, in the, in, even of the way that Engels and Marx legitimately did whatever else uh, went wrong about it. And, and there's a very last point. Um, the book, The Screwtape Letters, by C.S. Lewis, where he's the uncle demon or devil is educating his uh, his nephew. And he says to him, he says, the main, and, and this is a brilliant way to begin to think about oppositional. He says, you have to get people to think in a particular way. And if we think about the, the past, the present, uh, and the future, and eternity, you have to, you have to work it with this model that you can use the past and you know, say with a widow or someone with regret to manipulate them so you can kind of possess them, if you like, or put them on the wrong path or whisper in their ear. Um, and the present is what you don't want them to live in. You don't want them to live in, you don't, the, the good people, you don't want them to live in the present if you want to corrupt them. And you don't want them to live in it with a sense of eternity. So that's what you have to get them out. You can use the past, but the best thing is the future. The future everything in the future, promise them everything in the future, get them to live in the future, not the present and not in an eternal sense. And then you have them. And if you look at all the movements, a lot of the major movements, futurism in the first decade of the 20th century, futurism was the basis of a lot of, uh, well, uh, the New World Order, a lot of this type of science, of fascism, of communism, they're very, very big into that, a whole lot of them, Nietzschean, superhuman, futurism, non-spiritual, the future would be great, the machine, war, death. This is what the, future, the Italian futurist says. We love speed. We love uh, death, war. Uh, so the future. So C.S. Lewis was expressing a very, very uh, astute and deep theological point that seen from the perspective of a demonic force, the future is, is, is what it promises to you. As against living in the present, which all the major spiritual traditions tell us to do, uh, to be aware of the present, mindful, etc. in the Buddhist tradition, um, or the Taoist or the martial arts tradition, uh, and with a sense of the eternal, the eternal, that a sense that you are an eternal, uh, eternal being. You have to cut that out, and then you can manipulate fear to get them to do what, what the, so it's a, it's a very, it's a very good sense to begin to think about how we're manipulated uh, by, by these forces, and how all of these promises in the future that it's going, it's going to be great and you're going to be, you know, abundance and all that uh, while they're destroying the environment and uh, sp spraying poisons, etc. And people are getting weaker and enfeebled. Uh, we have to put a stop to this. We have to live in the present and in the eternal sense and look for antidotes uh, conceptually to their moves because 
we're in the final stages of the of the game. Yeah, it's interesting. The original Hawaiian language had no past and future tense, and of course, and that wasn't the only indigenous culture, but uh, also why the missionaries forbid them to speak their native tongues uh, very often. Um, James, once point. again, I'm abs yeah, uh, I'm absolutely uh, astounded at your depth of knowledge once again, and this has just been you know really educational for me, and I, I appreciate it greatly. So, how can our audience uh, track your work? And and I'm really looking forward to reading your last two books. I'm gonna uh, after we hang up here, I'm gonna order them right away. So, uh, how can we uh, how can we find your works? What's the, all the links that uh, are best to use? There's just one link. I don't use any other social media, so it's just jamestoney.com. So there's a link to some paintings and interviews and uh, reference mm -hmm. to the, the books. Um, so they can find uh, find it there. Um, and I, I don't use any other uh, social media on that. Uh, and I'd just like to say thank you uh, to you two, um, uh, Bear and Mike. And uh, it's nice to hear that or, or to have the sense that there's other people flying out there as well and I, i've uh followed your work and, and i appreciate it in particular the uh, your kind of walk in the walk uh, i would have one stage I, I really intended to go on the kind of hair biology all that learning but you have to dedicate your life to that you can't do that in a sporadic way so i have great respect for people that that do that but um we all have different talents that we have to uh, fulfill and real science as you say and, and the real idea of the individual discovering the the, the secrets of the, the the universe um which was also <laughs> um which was also used in relation to by, by um Keynes when he's describing what Isaac Newton believed he was doing he was unlocking this uh, these secrets of the universe that are there for us to find um so uh good luck with your work i appreciate and i appreciate the opportunity as always a pleasure the last time and i hope i won't get any any more uh criticism here for for going on too long as i did the last time but, not at uh, all uh, there's a lot well, there, there's two there's two formats you know and and mike and i wrestle with this we say well maybe we should just do you know more shorter little things because a lot of people enjoy that attention spans aren't what they used to be and maybe you get some more hits for your podcast but we just really don't feel that you can have the the depth of conversation or really get to know people in in 20 minutes so yeah. we've uh we've adopted and stuck with the long form and it seems to be okay maybe our audience isn't as large as some folks but uh the the, the people that appreciate this are our loyal no, followers there's, and a, there's, a, there's an interesting quality of people out there and, and sometimes you need to listen to a longer explanation to find the little pieces the little pieces i'm finding all the time that connects things that you didn't mm -hmm. see were were connected and when you do begin to see it you can't go backwards you can't undo it and you can also tactically understand better what's happening strategically etc and and deeper than that and, and it's empowering when you do begin to uh to connect the dots in, in, in that sense so uh, i agree with you and we used to have those things called pubs and where people could talk <laughs> till the cows <laughs> came home and maybe get to the end of uh, some argument or discussion about the things. And we need to have that conviviality, as Illich talked about, to begin to ex explore the uh, stuff. And again, also, I encourage people to look back at the body of your work, uh, as I do, this, the, the previous work that you've done, anticipating some of these contexts very well uh, before other people were talking about it. So the body of work, the gestalt is important as well. So I think it fits in. It's not self-contained. It fits into the, the, the overall flow. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, James. Yeah, I think our second episode in 2017 we did was about transhumanism. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so... I noticed that. Yeah, I, I did. Uh, I, I, I thought that was impressive. Uh, that, that was good uh, <laughs> uh, to get in there. Yeah. Well, hey, thanks so much. And yeah, as Barry pointed out, it's uh, one thing that is severely lacking in mainstream scientism is the concept of quality, the qualitative qualitative nature of science. And that's something we definitely have in our audience here is a high degree of quality in the chat today. It was on fire. Uh, so many deep um, just insights and wonderful tangential comedy to a lot of humor in our audience and i was saying that very early on in the chat 
one thing AI never has, and artificial intelligence, which nothing to do with intelligence, will ever have true humor, right? Where yeah. does humor come from? Humor is the spark. Yeah. Fantastic the point. Amazing yeah. point. Yeah. So you guys are funny. You make me laugh. You're awesome. Thanks for supporting James. Go to his website, jamestunny.com and purchase his books. Do you, are you selling art still? Do you sell art, James? Or, or um, I, like, I, I do, always... but I, I've been uh, so busy writing the books uh, that, I, that, that I, I felt dedicated. I mean, I, I, I'm painting away, uh, but I'm not concentrating at the moment because I need to get the books out because I I don't think we'll be able to get such books out in the future. I really believe it'll get more difficult. Uh, on that point about the comedy, uh, there's, a, there's a, an English comedian, Bob Monkhouse, who said, when I started out in, in comedy years ago, uh, people laughed at me. They're not laughing now. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <Great. laughs> It'll be great to get you back on maybe six months or typical probably time we get to get us back on because I'd like to go deeper into art and imagination related to this topic. You are well known for having your art behind you on all your interviews and I love how you always change it up and thoughts on that and kind of where we're going in terms of the creative soul and, um, and all yeah, that. Good, so, good, uh, yeah, good idea. Yeah, and yeah. what true art is as well to, as like yep. true science, what true art is as opposed to a lot of people describing themselves. Uh, uh, as artists. <laughs> Well, hey, James, thanks Everything so much again. Everything should be an artistic avenue. Yeah, yeah exactly. Uh, well, love you guys. Everyone in the chat, thanks for hanging out today. Go support James, jamestunny.com. Uh, his website is in the show notes below. Remember to get out, just get outside, get your feet in the dirt, go plant something, go for a hike, go ground yourself in nature. Mother Nature is always the greatest teacher. Go show her some love. Uh, it's pouring rain out there, but I'm going to try to fish maybe a little later today and commune with the animal spirits of the river. Love you guys. We'll uh, see you next week with Marjorie Wildcraft joining us to go into. Uh, that's going to be great. Yeah, that'll be a great talk. And uh, you guys all I have wanted a great to talk about dirt. I forgot that was what I was going to talk about. Hygiene and sanitation is all part of it. <laughs> yeah, we, we've we've got to do we've got to yeah. do a return one in a couple yeah. months. Here. Sorry for interrupting. You. I just have to get that off my chest. Yeah, sorry. Exactly right. I know they want us to live in a completely perfect salad bar where everything's glass in front of us. Uh, okay, guys. Uh, we'll see you next week. Love y'all. Bye bye.